Hi, I'm Brett from PaperCartridges.com at the shop in beautiful downtown Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And today we are talking about this. This is the world's first smokeless powder rifle. Of course, this is the French Model 1886 Lebel. And this rifle used a revolutionary smokeless powder cartridge when it was introduced uh, in 1886 and made all of the black powder cartridges in use around the world obsolete overnight. <laughs> when the... I'm... What? Well, the Franks didn't make the first smokeless powder rifle. Who did? <laughs> Austria? And what was their smokeless powder rifle? Mm -hmm. The, the Lorenz. And when did they put smokeless powder in the Lorenz? In 1862? You are crazy. Everyone knows the 1886 Lebel was the first smokeless... Is that music? Where's that music coming from? That better not be Austrian marching music. If that's the Radetzky march in here, this is a video on the Lebel. This is the coolest gun. Stop! No, stop! Now, before y'all rush to the comments to tell me how wrong I am, uh, yes, that was satire, and the 1886 Lebel absolutely was the first successful military smokeless powder rifle, and the Austrian Empire never adopted a smokeless powder cartridge for their Lorenz rifle musket, although they almost did. Now, this... Oh, if I can <laughs> borrow Othias's patented grunt... This big guy was almost maybe the world's first smokeless powder rifle. Of course, this is the Model 1854 Lorenz. This is a very conventional percussion, muzzle-loading, black powder rifle musket. Uh, versions of this were used extensively during the American Civil War. And no one under any circumstances should ever load one of these with any kind of smokeless powder. Uh, but this rifle was not the world's first smokeless powder rifle, largely because of what happened exactly 161 years ago today. So today is July 30th, 2023, and 161 years ago, this very day, a world away from here, a magazine blew up uh, at 3 in the morning at the Kaiserliche Königliche training base at Simmeringer Heide, which is uh, just outside of Vienna. Today it's an urban suburb. Uh, it's pretty cool that the street names still reflect what it used to be. So there's like the Redan Street and uh, Firing Line Street. But in 1862, uh, Simmering Ahida was a significant training base for uh, experimenting with new weapons. Uh, so they had shooting ranges there. Obviously they had the gunpowder magazine. And in 1862, it was full of black powder, three metric tons of black powder but there was also something else inside that magazine. Uh, they had an experimental new gun propellant uh, known in German as uh, Schießbaumwolle, which in English literally means shooting cotton. This, of course, is gun cotton. It's a primitive nitrocellulose single base smokeless powder. And uh, in the Simmering Ahida magazine, there were also three tons of this gun cotton. And on the calm, peaceful morning of uh, July 30th, 1862, uh, the magazine exploded completely without warning. Uh, it woke up all of Vienna at 3 in the morning, shook all the windows. Uh, there was no external cause identified, and a subsequent investigation determined that it had been caused by the gun cotton spontaneously igniting. Before we go any further, we should pause and go back and consider what exactly is gun cotton and what were the Austrians trying to do with it? So we can go back a couple decades to about 1846 uh, when gun cotton was discovered by uh, Professor Schoenbein, who was a German-Swiss chemist. And supposedly, so this is how the story goes. Uh, he's experimenting in his kitchen with sulfuric acid and nitric acid, and he's mixing them all together, as one does. And, of course, he spills some of the stuff, and he reaches for the first thing he can grab, and it's his wife's cotton apron. And he's soaking the spill up, but he doesn't want his wife to know what he's been doing in her kitchen. So he hangs the apron up next to the stove so that it will all the acids will dry out, and then you know she'll be none the wiser. But once it dried out, that cotton apron 
heat it up next to the stove and it explodes. And that, so the story goes, is how uh, Professor Schoenwein invented uh, gun cotton. And it's almost certainly apocryphal. Uh, I haven't encountered any 19th century sources with this tale. Uh, there's plenty in the 20th century. They start showing up around 1970. But by 1846, Schoenbein was already an eminent chemist. He was a professor at the University of Basel. He discovered the modern fuel cell in 1839. He discovered ozone in 1840. So this guy is not a mad scientist or some alchemist just randomly mixing chemicals in his kitchen. Uh, but anyways, uh, he did discover gun cotton uh, circa 1846, and he gave it its German name of Schießbaumwolle, which literally, of course, is shooting cotton, because Schoenbein himself believed that this stuff could be proposed as a powerful substitute for black powder. So gun cotton, it's simply cotton that has been converted uh, by acids into nitrocellulose. Uh, similar to a single base modern smokeless powder, uh, which is what the label used originally in 1886. But gun cotton is about four times stronger than black powder by weight. And uh, after Schoenbein discovers it, most of the powers uh, in Europe, including the United States, start experimenting with this powerful new explosive. Uh, but when they loaded it in gun barrels, it always burst them. And not only did it burst the barrels, but it shattered them. Uh, nothing can contain this gun cotton explosion. The factories that the various European powers were using to make it, they started blowing up. Uh, in 1847, uh, the British built the factory at uh, Faversham, and it exploded. Uh, it killed 18 people, and they only found eight bodies. The rest of them had, were gone. Now keep in mind, this is 1847, and they're working with a real explosive, not black powder, uh, with, with real shattering effects. No one had ever seen this before, so it really was scary stuff. And the gun cotton must be cleansed of all of the acids involved in the production process, because if the tiniest amount of acid is left on the gun cotton, it will start to decompose. The decomposition process generates heat, and that heat can trigger a spontaneous ignition. Uh, so from all these problems, by about 1850, the powers of Europe gave up. They decided this stuff is just, it's too crazy. It's uncontainable. It blows our guns to shreds. The factories blow up. We can't get it to do any useful work. And it will never be able to replace black powder as a gun propellant because black powder is surprisingly stable it's pretty safe it's powerful but it's not too powerful and everyone in europe abandoned experiments into gun cotton with the sole exception of the austrian empire most people don't think of the old 19th century austrian empire for its groundbreaking military innovations uh, but an austrian artillery officer and uh, Wilhelm Lenk von Wolfsburg was convinced that the problems with gun cotton could be solved by experiment. And uh, he began a 15-year effort to get gun cotton arms and ammunition adopted by the Austrian army in the early 1850s. Uh, he convinced the, the new emperor, Franz Joseph, to endorse his efforts, and he built a... Uh, the Imperial Royal Gun Cotton Factory went up in Hürtenberg in Lower Austria in 1851. And the first challenge with gun cotton is to make a stable form of it that will not spontaneously ignite during periods of storage because it's useless to make this great new propellant when you just don't know when it's going to burst into flames. So gun cotton is produced by soaking it in sulfuric and uh, nitric acids, then drying it out and any of that acid stays on it. Now it's there's a risk of the spontaneous ignition. So Link's process was to make the gun cotton and then wash it for sometimes six or eight weeks. He would take the gun cotton out of the acid and put it in a stream of moving water and leave it there for two months. And that washing action would remove all of the acids. Probably not the most environmentally safe method, but it worked to make a surprisingly stable gun cotton. In fact, it made a very, very safe gun cotton for over 12 years 
there was no spontaneous ignition of Link's gun cotton. So uh, he even claimed, and you got to give him some justification, that making gun cotton is safer than black powder because black powder mills were blowing up all the time in this period. But he had figured out how to make the gun cotton, not only make it safely, but make it so that it would not ignite. Link also figured out how to use gun cotton in firearms relatively safely. Uh, later on, they would slow down the explosive action of gun cotton chemically. That's what the French did in, with the label. But von Link slowed it down mechanically, and he discovered that if the gun cotton is not compressed, if it's allowed to hold more space inside a chamber, we can slow down the rate of burning. He also discovered that if we weave the gun cotton into a, a kind of fabric, the thickness of the strings in, that, in the fibers will determine how fast it burns. So if you want a slow burn, it's like for an artillery piece, you would use very thick strands of gun cotton, almost like rope. But if you wanted a quicker burn, say for small arms, you could use smaller threads in the, in the fabric. So this is a uh, recreation of one of Link's gun cotton cartridges for the Lorenz rifle. I'll get some close-up pictures. Uh, this, is, this is an inert example. There are only uh, two known surviving uh, Link gun cotton cartridges left in the world. Uh, so they're, they're not very common at all anymore. Uh, but as you can see, there's a stick that protrudes out of the base of uh, ordinary compression bullet, which was in use at the time uh, for the Lorenz rifle. And the Austrians even called this stick uh, the matchstick. And the gun cotton simply was woven as part of the manufacturing process. Uh, the original bullets had a little nub sticking out of the top, and that made the whole bullet stick into a spindle. And the gun cotton would be woven onto the stick, and then the sleeve of gun cotton got slid over those strands. And there you had the uh, cartridge. Now, the most important thing about the gun cotton small arms cartridge is that it cannot be compressed. If this, if the stick somehow was removed and this got rammed down the barrel and compressed, it would blow the gun up every single time. Uh, but instead, this stick physically bottoms out at the bottom of the chamber, and it ensures that you've got all of this space left so that the gun cotton fibers can slowly burn their way up relatively. All this happens you know, darn near instantaneously, but slow enough that it will generate pressure similar to the way black powder did, and it can launch the bullet out the barrel without shattering the barrel. Uh, these cartridges were never intended to be rammed. The soldier wouldn't pull the ramrod out and ram them down the way he would uh, a regular bullet. Instead, uh, the soldier just took the cartridge dropped it down the muzzle and it would slide all the way down and then Link converted uh, Lorenz rifles. The breech face had an indentation formed into it and the stick would fall down and wedge itself into the indentation and that kept it from falling out if the soldier tipped the barrel down. But there was no, uh, no use of the ramrod. You do not want to compress this, uh, this charge. So it's real quick and easy to load, and gun cotton creates no fouling to speak of. Unlike black powder, which leaves all kinds of cruddy residue behind, gun cotton is a modern single-base nitrocellulose propellant. It leaves almost nothing, and it also creates very little smoke, um, virtually no smoke, hence smokeless. But this the soldier could load it very quickly, um, but if two of these inadvertently would be loaded into the barrel, then it, it turns the rifle into a grenade. Uh, even with the woven gun cotton, the gun cannot handle that kind of pressure. It will shatter. Gun cotton burst barrels are catastrophic uh, compared to black powder. So the obvious solution to this problem would be to use a breech loader so that you would just load a gun cotton cartridge in from the breech. You can make sure it only fits one round. It's safe. But in uh, circa 1861, in, in the uh, eternally shoestring budget Austrian Empire, that was a non-starter. They were not even considering looking at breech loaders, uh, circa 1861, 1862. So instead, they had to come up with a, a 
method, a safety method to prevent the soldier from double loading his rifle, which with a muzzle loader is extremely common. And they came up with a fairly clever mechanical, physical, uh, loaded chamber indicator, I guess you could almost call it, where they put a cardboard wad, a round cardboard disc, would be lightly attached to the nose of the bullet. So when the soldier goes to slide the cartridge down the barrel, that disc would detach and it would remain physically in the muzzle of the gun. And that served as an indicator that there is a round uh, down the barrel don't load another one unless you want to turn your Lorenz into a hand grenade. And by the very limited accounts we have, this was reasonably successful. I haven't seen anything in the literature that suggests that uh, double loaded guns blowing up were uh, a serious problem during the Austrian tests. So practically, this is what loading the gun cotton cartridge into the Lorenz would look like. As you can see, there's the divot in the base of the breech face. And as the cartridge is loaded, the stick fits into that recess in the breech face and holds it there um, firmly. And when the gun is fired, uh, the wooden stick got blasted out with the bullet and it fell usually just a few feet in front of the muzzle. So by the spring of 1862, uh, Link's experiments have been going on for a decade. They've been extremely successful and word starting to get out. Uh, even though this whole gun cotton project was an Austrian state secret, uh, the Austrians were starting to field experimental artillery batteries that used gun cotton as a propellant and also gun cotton as a bursting charge. And in fact, the main effort, uh, Link being an artillery officer, the main focus was to develop uh, superior gun cotton artillery for the Austrian army. And uh, the story of the Austrian gun cotton artillery is fascinating. It really deserves its own video. Uh, I might do one later. Let me know if you want me to cover that. It's a little bit outside of my, my niche, but uh, it it's, is a fascinating story. But small arms, Austrian small arms, circa 1862, uh, was something of an afterthought, frankly, in, in the Imperial Royal Army. After the wars of 1859 of the Italian independence, uh, the Austrians lost faith in the value of firepower on the battlefield. And that might seem a little unusual, but they had a lot of good reasons. Uh, they were defeated by the French uh, in 1859, major battlefields. We had the emperors of France and Austria both leading their armies on this open plain in uh, northern Italy. And the French soundly defeated the Austrians. And the French were using bayonet-focused assault tactics, uh, Stoss tactic in, uh, in the German. And the Austrians had relied uh, not very much, but they, their doctrine was more uh, still bayonet-heavy, but fire will be a key component of our tactics. And then when they got their clocks clean in 1859, they changed their mind. Uh, even though the, the Austrians were very slow in fielding the Lorenz rifle, uh, Dr. Walro, in his excellent book, The Austro-Prussian War, uh, speaks of Austrian reservists being marched right up to the battle, like on the eve of battle, and they're being handed brand new Lorenz rifles that are still slick with factory grease and then immediately sent into battle. So they, they never were allowed to uh, train on those weapons. But after those defeats... Uh, the Austrians took a dramatic shift away from firepower and they embraced the bayonet assault. Uh, it takes a lot of time and money, as I've covered in many of my other videos, to train a soldier, to train a 19th century soldier in the, in the rifle musket era how to estimate distance and uh, accurately use a rifle at long range. It's expensive. It takes a lot of time. It is so much cheaper, and the Austrians came away with the conclusion that it's also just more effective to pack soldiers into a column and launch that column at an enemy position and uh, carry it by the bayonet. And we know now this had disastrous consequences uh, when Austria uh, fought Prussia in, uh, in the War of 1866. Uh, and that resulted in a catastrophe that almost toppled the entire Austrian Empire. And the Austrian assault tactics uh, were not effective against the Prussians. They were using the Dreise. Sundnadelgewehr, the needle rifle, uh, 
um, and the Austrians charged into these uh, rapid firing uh, Prussian breech loading guns. But more so at the operational level, the Prussians also outmaneuvered this larger, clumsier Austrian army. So after the Battle of 18, uh, Battle of Königgratz in 1866, uh, Prussia became the, the center of what would become the unified Germany in 1871. And Austria almost slipped uh, in its status as a great power. Uh, it was polit politically split in 1867 with the, the compromise with Hungary. And it would croak on <laughs> another uh, half a century, this quasi-medieval uh, relic uh, of the, the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, to 1914, when Austria-Hungary fires the first shots of uh, the First World War, and it could be argued we're still very much living in the world that resulted uh, from from the events of uh, 1914. Now, all of that <laughs> European history aside, let's zip back again to 1862, when the Austrian gun cotton experiments are doing very well, and von Link had developed uh, his practical smokeless powder cartridge for the Lorenz rifle. And uh, they perform tests on speed of loading. And uh, in these tests, they found uh, 55 rounds could be fired in 9 minutes and 30 seconds. That's a rate of fire of 6 rounds per minute. That's right there with the, uh, the Prussian needle rifle. The needle rifle might squeak a round or two out. Uh, I got a video on uh, a mad minute with the needle rifle. And uh, I think I got seven or, or maybe eight, but six rounds per minute out of the smokeless powder Lorenz cartridge versus seven rounds out of the needle rifle with black powder, low velocity, smoky. Um, these cartridges barely make any smoke and they don't leave any fouling residue behind. So your, your rifle will not lose accuracy over long-term firing like a black powder rifle would. And uh, they, the Austrian army issued entire army corps uh, with gun cotton cartridges, not operationally, but they, uh, they issued them to the active soldiers just to carry around with them as they did their day-to-day -day army stuff. You know, they're marching around, they're doing soldier stuff. And uh, the cartridges were found to hold up very well to long-term rattling around in the soldiers' cartridge boxes. And these cartridges had the potential, well, they didn't have the potential, they did increase the muzzle velocity uh, of the Lorenz rifle beyond uh, what black powder uh, could do. So slow velocity uh, and the, the high arching trajectory of a rifle musket requires all of that training for the soldier. Uh, almost all the rifle musket training is how you can engage targets beyond 300 yards because of that parabolic arc. But if you can flatten the trajectory and it, you don't need to train soldiers to be as accurate in the estimation of the distance, even your dumbest Habsburg conscript only has to point and shoot. Uh, the one model of the Lorenz has a fixed block sight until 1862, and they finally gave everyone the better sight. But the, the early model Lorenz, uh, most soldiers received just a fixed sight that went out to 300 Schritt, which uh, the, approximately a yard, maybe 250, 270 yards. But with uh, a gun cotton cartridge, that sight can now be extended out to 400, maybe even 500 Schritt because the bullet is moving faster. So less training for a soldier, which is cheaper, and Austria-Hungary loves cheaper, gives you dramatically increased battlefield effectiveness, uh, basically like a modern rifle. And that what is what was so revolutionary about the Lebel. It, it wasn't necessarily that it used smokeless powder. It was that they had figured out a way with smokeless powder to increase the muzzle velocity of the gun. Now you're talking about 2,000 feet per second. So your bullet stays within the height of a six-foot enemy soldier over a much longer distance, which makes military firearms so much more effective. Uh, and Austria was this close to operationally fielding uh, some of these gun cotton cartridges uh, in, in the mid-1860s. It's kind of staggering to ponder. Now, there were still 
serious issues that had to be worked out. Even in the summer of 1862, uh, the gun cotton would wear out the guns uh, more rapidly than uh, with the old black powder. But Link had demonstrated that it's possible to overcome these challenges with experiments and patience and uh, figuring out how we can adopt the stuff to work. So there was a lot of excitement uh, in Austria that um, units would be operationally issued, this new gun cotton artillery, and then eventually someday the infantry with the, the gun cotton small arms ammunition. And several Austrian military newspapers made uh, bold predictions of what was going to come. And uh, coincidentally, the Model 1862 Lorenz, which gave every soldier a long-range sight, was entering production with an all-steel barrel. And the steel held up to the gun cotton a lot better than the old iron-barreled uh, Lorenz guns. So things are are really getting interesting in Austria. And then 3 a.m., 161 years ago today, July 30th, 1862, the Simmeringer Haida magazine blows up, wakes everyone up, uh, and rattles windows for miles. And, uh, and they don't really know what caused it, but it's, the investigation said it was the spontaneous ignition of gun cotton. And Link, by the way, he didn't think it was that big of a deal. Uh, he conceded maybe somehow a tiny bit of acid remained on one of the rounds and that, uh, that, that might have set it off. But he said, look, we've been successful for 12 years. We have one accident. Let's revisit our production techniques and maybe find a way to make sure that with even stricter manufacturing methods, we can eliminate this possibility in the future. And it wasn't a magazine packed to the, you know, three metric tons. That's a lot of powder. That's a big bang. But that's not really all that much if you consider uh, how much armies consumed in powder. It was a training magazine. So Link consider it, this is a learning, mo learning moment for us. Let's figure out what went wrong and move on. But the tide was turning uh, because he had a lot of detractors. Obviously, this is revolutionary new technology. Whenever that appears in a military context, you've got people, uh, you know, iron sights are good enough for me, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you, so he had all of those kind of people. Black powder has been good enough. It was good enough for Radetzky. It's good enough for Prince Eugen. It's going to be good enough for me. And his detractors did have a point because uh, they're... The instability of cotton, it could explode. Okay, that's one problem. But the other problem, this was more serious in the miserly Habsburg Empire, is that by 1862, cotton had become extremely expensive because of... One of the very first things that the Confederate Congress did in 1861 was ban all export of cotton uh, from the Confederacy in hopes of forcing Europe to side with the South uh, by depriving them of cotton for the, the massive European textile industry. So the American Civil War raises the price of cotton so high in Europe that now ordinary black powder is many times cheaper than this gun cotton stuff. Um, now cotton was starting to be cultivated in Egypt and India, but it wouldn't reach the European markets for another year or two and uh, this meant that the anti-gun cotton lobby in Austria, uh, they were able to convince the emperor that he needed to pull the plug. Uh, so he disbands the uh, artillery batteries. And uh, Link was allowed to continue his experiments uh, and continue producing gun cotton until there was another explosion in 1865. This was a, a much larger explosion. Uh, and, and that just finally sealed the deal. But for our practical purposes, any hope of Austria fielding a smokeless powder rifle like the Lorenz uh, went up in smoke as a result of that magazine explosion exactly 161 years ago today. And General Link never denied that there were problems with the gun cotton and he continued to believe that these problems could be solved with research and experiments. And he argued that the prize is worth the expense and the difficult process of getting there. And we know he's right. 
25 years later, 1886, you know, the a Frenchman discovers uh, a safe, cheap, and effective way to harness the power of essentially gun cotton and nitrous cellulose and uh, chemically slow it down and, and use it as a propellant, a powdered B for the 1886 label. And it's, I always wonder how close was Link to making uh, a breakthrough of that magnitude like if if that magazine did not explode if there were a couple more years of the emperor giving him government support could he have done it could link have produced a safe effective gun cotton cartridge and what would the results have been if he had so just for fun this is this is for fun this is counterfactual history this is what if ism so uh, if if that turns you off find something else to watch but let's just say for fun for sake of intellectual argument the magazine at simmering ahida makes it through the night on july 30th 1862 it doesn't explode and uh, if link is allowed to continue his research uh, and he can discover a truly safe method of producing the gun cotton so that it will not spontaneously ignite it's as safe as any other modern smokeless powder uh, we can assume that after a, a couple more years, uh, the gun cotton artillery batteries, which were experimental, would be approved and they would start to enter operational service in the Austrian army, probably around 1863. And that would be just in time for them to be sent north uh, to uh, Denmark in the Schleswig War of 1864. And obviously the Austrians would be interested in seeing how do these gunpowder weapons perform on the battlefield. And it seems likely to assume that the gun cotton artillery would have performed very, very well. And if the gun cotton artillery performs well, why not adopt uh, gun cotton cartridges for the infantry? And if you adopt the gun cotton cartridges for the infantry with so many new advantages, so a flatter trajectory and no smoke, and your soldiers can be more effective with less training and most of all, cheaply, why not shift Austria's tactical doctrine away from the bayonet and start to bring more emphasis back on firing? Uh, just because the capabilities of these weapons are so much profoundly greater than black powder that even the most diehard uh, advocate of the bayonet might concede that, yeah, we, we might want to take advantage of some of this new technology. So in 1866 uh, at Königgratz, uh, instead of the Austrian assault columns fixing bayonets and charging at, right up into the muzzles of the, the Schnellfeuer Dreise needle rifles, it could have been the Prussians who found themselves having to get within range, uh, get within the effective range of the needle rifle up against the Austrian troops. Because the Dreise, it, it, you could fire it quickly, but consider in 1866, the Dreise is 25 years old. It, it is obsolete, and you can fire it just about as fast, maybe a little faster than the gun cotton Lorenz, but the Dreise bullet is moving very slow, uh, half the speed of a, of a Lorenz gun cotton bullet. And for the Dreise needle rifle to be effective, the Prussians got to get within about 300 yards. And to get within 300 yards of Austrian infantry armed with a smokeless powder flat trajectory rifle is nearly suicidal. Uh, so it's, again, this is all uh, purely hypothetical, but you got the Prussians fighting the, not only the Austrian infantry with gun cotton, smokeless high velocity small arms, but they've also got the Austrian artillery with gun cotton shooting gun cotton shells uh, that a shattering explosive effect. And uh, Königgratz may have ended up, instead of a clean cut, smashing Prussian victory, it might have turned into a bloody stalemate. And uh, Moltke might have managed to operationally encircle the Austrian army through brilliant operational coordination. But the Prussian losses probably would have been 
overwhelming and a a stalemate, a draw for Austria is a victory uh, because Austria in July of 1866 is still mobilizing and they can field a much larger force over time. The Prussians have one shot at winning this war and that was Königgratz. So the Prussians in 1866 are forced to accept a humiliating peace. And what does that mean for the future of a unified Germany? Uh, what does that mean for the 20th century? Um, where where do those threads lead? If we were to, to play the, we can play the what if game all day, uh, and that's it's it's pure fiction. But sometimes it is it's just fun to close your eyes and imagine what might have been, if a tiny little bit of acid wasn't left on a strand of gun cotton that ends up in a magazine uh, along the Danube River in the summer of 1862. Who knows? But I'm Brett from papercartridges.com. I do hope you enjoyed uh, this little bit of a deep dive in some real obscure ordnance. Um, but if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a, a like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.